I am joined today uh, by a lovely chap called Keith. Um, Keith was a police officer and now he helps in a different way. Hello, Keith. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm not too bad. Um, Christian Police Association. Let's just start right away with that. Um, it sort of suggests that it's Christians, it's police and it's association. But just give us a bit of an overview. What's a Christian Police Association all about? Yeah, so the, the Christian um, Police Association is the is basically the oldest support network within the police service within the UK, um, founded by a lady called Catherine Gurney uh, many, many years ago, um, who saw a need for support for police officers in and around the area of London um, after a police officer had been kind to her. Um, we don't know the exact circumstances, but she she started the what became the christian police association then and we're still going strong we have branches in uh, almost every police service or every police force in the uk including scotland and uh, northern ireland and ultimately we is what it says on the tin we're christian cops um our our role is to bring christ into the police service see christ glorified within the police service to uh, build bridges between the uh, community and uh, police service so show how churches and Christian groups can work with the police and, and just generally to be a light within the, uh, some very dark places so to offer support to other Christians and to our colleagues right across the police service whether they have faith or not um, yeah I've been a member for ooh, most of my police service but never really got involved until around 2008 when I became more involved in leadership and doing a bit, some bits and bobs, but it's busy and there's a lot going on and we do a lot of good work with other faith groups in just helping out others. Okay. So you've been, um, you're actually working for the CPA now. You were a, a police officer and um, we'll come back to the police part in a moment, but what, why do you want to support the CPA now that you've, you've retired from the police service? Well, I, so now I am, um, so I'm a volunteer, so I, I'm a volunteer with the CPA in Scotland, where I live. Um, I um, I assist predominantly with speaking to new recruits about um, trauma and about looking after themselves. That's my main role up here. Um, but I'm also a trustee of the charity nationally, um, so I'm part of the governing body um, of the charity. But I think it's really, really important that from my nearly well nearly 30 years of policing in one guise or another that i'm able to pass on to new christian police officers the importance of living out their faith within the police service but also my experiences in the police service help me help younger officers look after themselves but with it also we get the odd uh, senior officer who will make a phone call because they're struggling and i'm able to connect with them and speak to them from a position of authority because I've been around the police most of my adult life. It's like anything though, I suppose if you've done the job, you kind of automatically have a level of respect that people would give you because you're not just there to help them. You have done the job, maybe not precisely, but if you've been a police officer, then helping a police officer is going to be easy because they immediately respect you because, well, you know what that job is like. Yeah, exactly. I mean, part of it, we, we often call it um, plingo, so police lingo. We, I speak their language. Yeah. So I, I understand I understand what they're talking about and, and what they mean. I understand where they're coming from. I've been through many of the, you know, same uh, circumstances that they have. I mean, having, you know, you never know what it's like to guard a broken window for five and a half hours in the freezing cold and the pouring rain until you've done it. And, and having been there as a new officer where you're the, you know, you get all the great jobs as the young cop, <laughs> you know, and you, you stand outside, you know, Iceland um, in, the, in the town centre waiting for a glacier to come in the middle of the winter. It's, um, it's certainly something that you remember. And when new cops are struggling, I'm able to say, yeah, I've been there. Even though I retired as a sergeant working from home uh, in a desk job, I've been there. I've been there at all the horrible things that you're going to. So I can stand up and say, yeah, this was my experience and this is how I, you know, I, I didn't come out of it completely unscathed, but how I cope with all the issues I've had over the years. 
Sure. Um, one of the things I've always had respect for the police is very similar to the armed forces, um, but perhaps less so in many ways. Actually, when you're a police officer, you start at the bottom and you work your way up. You don't just, you know, drop in off fancy being an inspector today. That's not really the career progression. So policing means you've actually done some hard work at some point. I'm guessing that is that still the case? It's It has changed somewhat. So you can, uh, they, they now run, uh, some forces run a direct entry kind of scheme where you go in either you can go in to be a trainee detective or you can go in at inspector level or at superintendent level now uh, there are differing views on that um, my, my view is that you know, as a retired police officer now I can speak about it that it's wrong um, that you should have been the new cop on the shift and done your time and learnt and learnt your lessons and been to jobs and made mistakes and uh, and and then everything that everyone else has done to show some credibility. Now, now some of the best cops I ever worked with were were constables for their entire service. Hmm. And the and the, you know I can think of detectives who were, you know, who did their time and then became detectives. And if I always say the the greatest accolade for any detective is that I would want them investigating my murder. Hmm. And and I've worked with some people like that in uniform and and in plain clothes where who I would want them investigating if something happened to me because they're the best cops ever and they're constables, but they've stayed and they've done the job. So if you're going to be in command and tell people what to do, I think you need to have um, got in the trenches and seen what's going on with frontline personally. Um, I cannot agree or disagree, but I think you're right. Um, <laughs> Uh, anyway, let's move on to your your police career. So, um, I'm guessing over like three decades, you wouldn't have would you have done different roles, or would you specialise in some ways? Yeah. So, so I started as a I initially started as a special constable, so a part time um, constable in my hometown of uh, Watford in Hertfordshire, where I did I did that for a couple of years. A lot that was a lot of walking around in in um, in the town mm. and doing patrol, but I did some work on traffic uh, policing. I was part of uh, what was known as the, the um, Scots team, so the Special Constabulary Operational Traffic Section in in, in Watford, and I and I worked with some really, really, really experienced um, traffic cops, which which piqued my interest in yeah. that particular role. I then um, I joined as a regular uh, constable at uh, Hemel Hempstead uh, again, doing all the stuff you would expect as as a new boy. Um, and then just worked my way through getting driving courses and, and doing stuff like that. So I was a response cop and then applied to go on to traffic. Uh, I was a traffic constable uh, working on the motorway and on division for about eight years where I was a um, speed enforcement instructor and a um, pursuit instructor um, for a while. And then uh, with one thing and another, I uh, actually got in trouble for not putting in for the sergeant's exam because mm -hmm. I... I'd run a couple of incidents where there was no sergeant, and I actually got I actually got told off by the area chief inspector for not getting promoted, and then got told off by my sergeant about half an hour later for not putting in for the <laughs> sergeant's exam, which is odd. And I wasn't allowed to leave the police station until I'd signed the form to put in for the exam. So <laughs> I um, I passed um, I passed my sergeant's exam uh, first time. Look at me, uh, first time, and then in two thousand and eight went to back to Watford on promotion where I, I was a response sergeant uh, for a couple of years working on a really great team of officers with some really good cops down at Watford and then did custody. So I was a custody sergeant. So I, I locked people up, looked after people for four years, which was interesting. I learned a lot there uh, about dealing with people, but actually had some really good instance of um, sharing the gospel and stuff like that with people and then moved back to, back to roads policing so back to traffic as a sergeant uh, initially as sort of the, if you've seen police interceptors in charge of a, a team of intercept cops and then back on to roads policing patrol uh, as a patrol sergeant as a, and as a road death SIO um, which caused me some um, uh, long-standing mental health problems and then in um, 2018 myself and my wife who's also a serving police officer decided that we wanted a change and we decided to apply for a transfer to Police Scotland, um, which uh, we've got family up here and we'd looked at it before, but we, we'd sort of pulled out before. And in 2019, in August 2019, we started up here uh, 
me as a response sergeant, my wife as a response cop at a little place called Lock Gilpin on the west coast of Scotland. And I've absolutely loved it. It's been great. Um, uh, my, my wife is now, my wife now works on a project. I worked on a couple of projects in my last few years. Um, up until, up until June this year when I retired. So yeah, I've done, I've done quite a lot. No, no sort of high level detective stuff, but lots of interesting things. And I've seen some things and done some things that you can't buy. So pursuit courses and stuff like that, where you, it's the course that money can't buy. Um, and I, as much as I've had some tough times in the police, I have to say I look back and smile and, and I've made some great friends and experienced some really good things and I wouldn't change it for the world. Fab. Um, I, I've got to say thank you for your service because I always do. I mean, someone from the armed forces or the police, you know, thank you for what you've done. We let, Let's go there a little bit. Um, I'm going to be very careful how I say this, but we've just been through some pretty severe riots in the UK. Um, they were maybe or maybe not, depending on your perspective, to do with some tragic deaths in um, Southport. But the the thing that I suppose I wanted to talk to you about as somebody who's been on the other side of the right shield one way or another is how, not what's your taking it. I'm not going there. But, you know, how do how do we respond as as civilians, I guess, when we look at what we see, the news gives us a particular slant on a story how how can we better respond, especially as Christians, to what we see and the way that the police are just shouted out for being this and that? And, you know, what what would be a good godly response as a civilian to what we've seen of how the police have been treated over those rights? Um, I mean, firstly, I, I always say, and I'll, I'll, I'll chuck this in there now, if, if everyone who's listening today forgets everything else I've said, right, and I mean this, they forget everything else I've said about my policing career, that's not a problem, but don't forget this. Pray for your police. I'll say it again. Pray for your police. Amen. That is so, so important. If I can get one message out, is that we want churches, we want Christian organisations, we want Christian individuals to be praying for their police officers. It is vital because prayer fuels everything in the faith world. And I really want people to pray for their cops. And that's the first and most important thing. Secondly, I think people have to remember that where in terms of the criminal justice system in the UK, it isn't like you see on the television in mostly American cop films or programs where you have the perp walk, where they identify the arrested person immediately. That isn't how it works here. It's literally, you usually get the 32 year old male helping police with their inquiries, which generally means 32 year old male has been arrested. We're not going to tell you any more. There's a reason for that. It's so it doesn't prejudice the person through the criminal justice system, whether people agree with that or not, it's the way it is. So what people have got to do is not react. They've got to wait for information. That's the most important thing. We, we, it's not that we, you know, not that we don't want to tell you what's going on. Generally, police officers can't tell you what's going on. Um, firstly, because they probably don't know. Your average cop on the street who's police in a, a demonstration somewhere is, is exactly that, a cop police in the demonstration. They're not involved in the major investigation team that's dealing with the murder or whatever's going on. So they don't know. All they're there to do is to keep people safe and protect property. Now, and you have to remember, they're normal cops. They're not, you know, today they'll be helping Mrs. Jones across the road um, or dealing with an accident. Tomorrow they're in riot kit with people throwing bricks up. So it's just a case of people need to wait and just see what's happening. Any information that can be shared will be shared. And then just, I always think we just need to keep calm because there's always people who are willing to stir up a little bit of trouble and cause mischief, to put it mildly. And it's not the, it's not the cops' fault. We're stuck right in the middle every single time. I like that idea. Pray for the police. I, I think that's a really, really good point. I will come back to that before we finish. Um, yeah, pray for the police. The thing is, we all like the police to come really, really quickly when we think there's a burglar mm. or we've had an accident and we need help. And we're like, okay, we want the police. Come quickly. I need your help. But we don't like it when we're doing 14 or 13 and we see blue lights <laughs> behind us because all of a sudden, could you go away? Now is not a good time for you to meet me. Leave me alone. But I think it's the, it is that juxtaposition, isn't it? Because yeah. I remember, I think I shared this with you at the gathering where we first met a little while ago. 
I, wa- I, I was watching some, and this, this, this police officer said, look, the problem is police officers today, this is about five, 10 years ago, we are the first people for far too many people who say no and mean no and enforce no. And yeah, it's quite a yeah. shock for people who think, well, I can do what I want. I have my rights. I get to do this. I get to do that. And he said, the problem is we as police officers, we're meeting these young people who've never been told no, or if they have, it's not enforced. And if it is enforced, there's no follow through, but we're saying not just, no, you can't, we're actually stopping them. Literally we'll arrest them, you know, and it's it's quite a shock to people to realize we actually have that power. And just talk us a little bit about, you know, how do we understand the the, the power that police have? Because obviously you, you did, you, you, police officers do, you know, how do we, how do we feel about that as Christians? I mean, I mean, it's, it's always an interesting one because I, I understand that in many ways the, the, the police officers or the, the police services um, relationship with the public is almost adversarial in some respects because when let's be honest we're never bringing you good news hmm. you know I, I always jokingly say in, in 30 years of policing I never stopped anyone to congratulate them about their driving um, you know it's not that type of relationship if we're we're stopping you we think you've done something wrong or there's something wrong with your vehicle if we're knocking on your front door you've been burgled or, or we're bringing you bad news um so i get it we're not like the fire service if you call the fire service and you see a fire engine coming you're, you're glad because they're going to rescue you sometimes we're bringing you the worst possible news so hmm. i get it but ultimately i think what people have got to remember not just christians but everybody is that we're human beings at the end of the day we you know i i put a jacket on every day for nearly 30 years to go to work that said police on it and then that's all it was it was a jacket it was a fleece it was a you know it was a coat it wasn't a suit of armor um and we're not just a uniform and people say oh you know we we don't just see uniforms well i I can tell you from experience that people do and the the prime example of this is policing a uh on duty at an accident in my hometown of watford and two two blokes walked down the high street towards me and it was my my oldest friend and still a good friend paul henderson and my brother richard and they walked either side of me within about two feet of me. And I went, all right, fellas. And they went, they both went, yeah, all right, mate, and carried on walking because all they saw was cop. Hmm. They didn't see me. And when I took my hat off and shouted at them, they both, you know, we laugh about it now and they, they both apologized, but <laughs> they saw the uniform, not, not the man inside it. And that's what, as Christians, I think we've got to remember that we equally need Christ as much as anyone else. Hmm. And, and we, we are equally uh, in need of, of prayer and support and, and God's love as everyone but wearing the police uniform doesn't make us invulnerable and i know that from bitter experience that it isn't a it isn't armor and it doesn't shield you and um, you react to stuff just like everyone else uh, let's go back to that idea of, of of christianity and faith so what is your story of faith I, were you raised in a christian home was it was it quite a dramatic encounter with god what, what's your story um so i'm uh so I'm originally from from a council estate in in Watford in Hertfordshire called Hollywell. Um, my we um, well, two brothers and we my mum and dad uh, we were never well off. We lived in a, a council house. My my dad was a dustman for my you know his, nearly his entire working life, and my mum my mum worked really hard doing jobs here there and everywhere, and eventually ended up working for a charity. So we were never never well off in terms of money, but I wouldn't sacrifice the fact that we had mum and dad around mm. for anything. So that's the first thing, but not raised in a Christian household. There was, n- there was no mention of faith really in our younger days. I was sort of, I was packed off to, um, I was packed off to Sunday school a few times at the local Baptist church across the road, but didn't really enjoy it and went to a, 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 um, a Christian sort of youth club with a friend from school called Andrew, hit run by his parents again, went a couple of times, didn't really see the point because I was playing sport and sport was massive in our house with me, mm. me and my brothers and so I sort of didn't go. And then in, in my teens, my my mum came to faith actually first in our house. And, um, and this is a true story. When my mum told me that she'd become a Christian, I my exact words were, you're mental. <laughs> uh, and you've been brainwashed <laughs> no that's that's true and we, we still laugh about that now how wrong can someone be um but i was really anti church didn't get it didn't really understand it and then um one of my brothers came to faith followed by the other one um and there was it left me and my dad i really wasn't having it but over 
over some time, I, so I met so Paul Henderson, who I already mentioned, I met him and we became friends through, I went to the church youth club and I'll tell you why I went to the church youth club, because there was a girl, <laughs> not going to lie, there was a girl there who I quite liked. So I started <laughs> going to the church youth club, Express Club, I shout out to anyone listening who used to go to Express Club in Watford on a Thursday night and I became friends with um, with, with Paul and then through a seemingly chance encounter one evening on a bus where I bumped into Paul, he invited me back to his house before I was going to play cricket. And I met his parents, Mick and Jean, who fed me and watered me, having never met me. And I got to know Mick and Jean, his parents, so well that they were both, now now they've both gone to glory, but they were known as Uncle Mick and Auntie Jean to me because I loved them so much. And um, they fed me every Thursday for about five years. Um, when I was coming to faith and when I'd come to faith. But it was really Mick and Jean and their love and their acceptance which really nudged me onto the path of coming to faith, which I really couldn't understand at the time why they were so nice, why they were so nice to me and they'd never met me and they didn't know me. So uh, I started going to church and just seeing what was in it. And then I think it was one um, cold winter's night. I was at church, wasn't feeling very well. It was an evening service. Uh, had a, I suffered terribly as a youngster with bronchial infections and chest infections and coughs. And I was sat at the back of the church with the temperature and coughing and spluttering. I went outside into the car park of um, West Watford Christian Fellowship, now Cornerstone Church, and was outside in the pouring rain, coughing my guts up. And the pastor came outside, a guy called David, and said, what's the matter? I don't feel very well. And he prayed for me, and it was a real simple prayer, just, Lord, Killed this young man and left me, hmm. and within five minutes I'd collapsed into a into a rose bush. I fell backwards into a rose bush. Wow! The boiling hot, uh, steaming hot in the rain, and was joined by a youth leader, Ricky, and a, one of the other elders in the church, a chap named Paul. And I, I literally went red hot to touch, and they were really worried. And then I, over about five minutes, I called back down again. And um, I was completely healed of the cough and the cold and everything else. And, wow. Uh, yeah. And, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, it does happen. Um, people, the miracles do happen. And I, I kid you not, I'd gone from coughing and sputtering the temperature in the throat like razor blades to feeling absolutely fine other than being soaking wet. And, um, and, and one of them asked me if I'd like to thank God for healing me. And I said, well, no, actually, I'd like to give my heart to Christ and sat in the <laughs> rose bush. Sat in a rose bush in the pouring rain in in a in the church car park at, uh, at the mission at West Watford. I gave my heart to Christ. Sat there. And, um, it's not been a it's not been a completely rosy ride since then. But I look back on that moment and um, it changed my life. And um, I I don't regret it one bit. Wow, um, I I love the fact you're sitting on a rose bush. I guess what you were scratched were you? Was it not too bad? Uh, yeah, there was some there was some um, there was some thorns in. Um, <laughs> places um that were i had to remove but uh, wow. um, but i you know yeah in all seriousness i when people say to me you know you know we don't see miracles well actually you know i i personally have experienced one i, I personally have experienced god's hand on me and the touch of healing which i i cannot even i've said to friends of mine who aren't christians they cannot explain it well i said explain it to me <laughs> because you know how ill I was when I was young and I've not had a chest infection since um I'm I've gone from from being completely unwell and feeling awful to completely fine in five minutes now you, you can't make that up and it was amazing and uh you know and I, so miracles do happen and um, yeah and, and praise God for that how how have you found um i mean you talk about you're now sharing with um new police officers how to share their faith or rather the importance of sharing their faith how have you found um being a christian as a police constable with your colleagues over the years did you find it particularly easy did you sort of pray every day for a hope of of chatting to somebody how, how did you actually be a christian if bad english but how were you being a christian in your job as a police officer with your colleagues so I was thinking for anyone, for anyone in any walk of life, whether it's school, college, you know, retirement club, work, whatever, is to live out your faith from day one. There's, I don't care what rank you are, how high up you are, you, you live out your faith and you live out your faith from day one, because then there's no question about what you actually believe. 
So I started at um, Hemel Hempstead. And there was sort of a bit of a tradition on the team there that everyone had a nickname, um, and uh, and you you were named by one of the sort of senior cops with your nickname. And this guy Dave took me up one day and he said, "We've decided on your nickname that we think is a bit risky." <laughs> and I said, "Well, go on then." And he said, "Well, we decided we're going to call you Dibley, as in the vicar." <laughs> um, so I'm assuming it, and I've always said it's not because I look like Dawn French. <laughs> uh, well, but actually, it's because, and he said no, it's because of uh, because you're a Christian. And I said I love it; it's fantastic. And I was I was known as Dibley for for many years, not in a horrible way, but just people would acknowledge that that I was a Christian and and never had an issue with it really. And um, when I uh, when I got promoted, I I always used to say to all my team, no matter what faith they were from. I pr- I prayed prayed for my team every single day on the way to work, um, and uh, so I would do that every day. And when I worked in custody, I I overheard somebody saying to another member of staff, "Is the padre here?" <laughs> and I dipped out from the office, and I could see my member of staff going, "No, be quiet, be quiet." And I, I said to this officer, "What did you What did you say then?" And he he wouldn't tell me. And I said, "Well, I'll just replay the CCTV if you don't." Tell me. <laughs> so, well, I asked if the padre was here, and I said, "Well, who's the padre?" Well, um, you, know, you are. So, why would you call me that? He said, "Because you always want to look after everyone, <laughs> prisoners and staff." I said, "Well," I said, "Do you know what? Do you know what I think of that?" And he went, "No." I said, "I think it's fantastic. Thank you so much. That's a really lovely thing to be called." And I w- I was known as the padre, and then the we had the Padres coffee bar in, on traffic where we had a little coffee machine where people could get a coffee and have a chat. And, hmm. and so I, I just found living out my faith uh, in the police was important. It wasn't easy because there are conflicting ideals and conflicting views. So like everything, and rightly so, we need to be respectful and uh, accept that people don't always agree with us. But generally, people are very, very accepting of the fact that you are there as a Christian and you're not being horrible and i'm not hitting anyone over the head with a bible or flick or sp- so I, was I haven't got a bottle of holy water under the desk to, to mm. spray you with if you need something then i'm here and it, it people were contacting the christian cops around them i need to speak to someone i need i need some help i need mm. i want someone to talk to because we're very often despite what more people may think about the church in inverted commas actually when people speak to me there's no judgment it's literally right you're having a bad day, okay? Tell me all about it, mm. and um, I can sit and listen. And um, actually, hopefully, I've had a positive impact on 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 cops and getting new cops to live out their faith is massively important. Mm. We were at the police colleges up here, myself and uh, Jim McDonald from the CPA. We're at the police colleges uh, towards the end of July for two days, just for a half hour, forty minutes, talking to new cops and. Out of 120 cops in one day, we had 12 new cops join the CPA, which is unheard of. Wow! Uh, which is fantastic, and you know, and the, you know, God gets the glory for that. But they they want to live out their faith. They want to be identified as Christian cops, and it's really, really important that they get the support they need because they're going to be doing this job for 40 years, hmm. and they need that. Who can I go? They need to know who is the other Christian cop at my police station where I'm having a bad day. I can go and find them and we can sit down and we can have a chat and a prayer and everything else. So, yeah, it's massively important. It is, everyone should be who they want to be at work. And if you're a Christian, that's no different. And coming back to the the thing that you said was the most important, let's finish with this. You said that if you do nothing else, you remember nothing else, pray for um, your cops, your police officers in your local area. How and what can people pray? Because I'm totally with you, but can you give sort of ideas of what what are the sort of things that people can actually do in their prayers? I mean, what are we praying for? We're praying for the families, we're praying for the job, with safety. Is is there sort of a particular way of, of thinking about praying that you would say was it was a good one? I I always my my first and most important thing was always for my cops to pray that they would be safe. And 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 that is the first and most important thing because ultimately as as a police officer through the years, I've gone from being a single man to being married, to having kids and a family and a wife. And my family want me to come home. I think that's no surprise. Mm. 
Mm. My kids want my kids want me to come home at the end of the day. Um, so, firstly, physical well-being and safety is massively important. Um, mental health and mental well-being. I have suffered significantly over my policing service. I've been diagnosed with PTSD and then complex PTSD, which has caused me to suffer with anxiety issues. So, cops' mental health is massively important. Um, the fact that we want cops to come to know Christ hmm. is sort of why we're here, really, to share the message that God loves them, he died for them, and that there's redemption in, in Christ is really important. That, so that there will be revival in the police service and also more widely for law and order. Um, when We've seen the scenes over the last few weeks, as you already alluded to, that there's no place for anything like that in this country. There's no place for it anywhere, but in our country, there's no place for riots and disruption on any side of, of any argument. There is no call for it, and I condemn it totally on all sides. But we want to pray for that. We want to pray for peace in our towns and peace in our neighbourhoods. And you'll be surprised when you see there have been people who have walked around towns in this country and areas in this country and have prayed extensively for the police and for law and order. And law and order has come. So God will have his will if we give it to him. And so safety, mental health, law and order. There you go. I don't remember if I shared this story with you when we were at the gathering or we did it live when we were chatting at the gathering. But um, Wolverhampton, there was a guy who was killed really tragically by the police. It's just a real, you know, not they killed him. It's just a real tragedy. And uh, yeah. so there were riots planned because, you know, the police had killed a guy and that's it. We're going to come and, and, and get the police. And opposite our particular church, there was a local police station um, in Wolverhampton. And we knew that rioters were coming. They were on trains and they were on buses. There was no hesitation. They were coming to that town by bus and by train and by car to come and destroy and attack that police station that was what they wanted to do um was it retaliation i seriously doubt it it was just an opportunity for having a go at the police but as a as a as a church as a group of churches across wolverhampton we gathered and prayed now bearing in mind this is on a hot summer's day in the summer okay this is a real not heat wave but it's really properly hot summer people stood out the front of that church we looked across at the police station and people were praying large gathering and it started to snow and it snowed so bad trains and buses couldn't get into wolverhampton there you go and that was even on i think it was on itv news at the time so when keith is saying pray for your police's protection don't ever think that your prayer doesn't matter because a Absolutely. group of christians in wolverhampton prayed for protection for this police station standing opposite and it snowed so bad and randomly it made international news it's snowing in wolverhampton in the smack in the middle of the summer on a hot day how has that happened oh it's a freak weather condition no it's because several hundred people gathered to pray right there you go and the and the police and by the time that the people got there they, it sort of dissipated and no one really to write anymore they sort of yeah. that all gone yeah god god has a funny way of doing things and um, <laughs> um also can i just say you, you are okay just to say hello to a police officer as well you go for it mate fine you know, can I, can I, no, not from my point of view. Can I just say for the for people listening, you can just stop and say hello to the police. It, 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 you know, and that's very that can for some cops it can be really really amazing because a lot of cops work on their own. Hmm. They only speak to people at jobs or when they're dealing with them. For actually someone just to stop and say hello is really a really nice thing. So I'd encourage that as well. But um, and I, I wish all my colleagues well across the country who are working today. Um, I, I'll follow that one up because we were at uh, Southampton Docks, like the not the Navy bit, but the, there's a museum next to the the next to where the Navy are based in Southampton, Portsmouth, and there are a couple of armed guys around. Obviously, it's a, it's an active base next door, and they're walking around, uh, big guns and stuff. And it's a bit, you know, in the UK, we're not used to police with guns. But I took my kids and said hello to them. And I think they're a bit shocked because yeah. most people just there was a bubble around them. And I just thought. Well, so what if they got a gun? They're trained for a start, yeah. and they're people. So we went yeah. and chatted to them, and I think there was a bit of a bit of a shock actually on them and they loved it and they got on their knees and they were chatting to the boys and stuff and talked to them about you know being a police officer and the guns which the boys wanted to know about which is understandable but i would absolutely endorse what he just said you know go and talk to your coppers because like keith who i'm chatting with now he's a man he's a husband he's a father he's been a son you know he's a real human being so don't just look at police officers and think oh it's terrible the media have said this be very careful what you hear. We need our police service. I still think our police service is the best in the world. Um, so go and talk to a copper and say hello and pray for them. Mm, My thought. Yeah. They, they say heaven is where the police are British, don't they? 
That's a part of a very well-known poem. I won't give the rest of it, but they say no. they do say well, heaven is where the police are British. And we're not, you know, I, I'm not going to say policing is perfect in in the UK. It isn't. There's been mistakes made. Anyone who denies that would be what we call a liar. There's things that have gone wrong, but ultimately, the majority of cops, myself included, I just went to work every day trying to do the best possible job that I did. I didn't always get it right, but. Um, you know, I just wanted to help people, and I think over the years I've managed to do that. And um, as now as a retired cop, I I just want to make sure that our new cops are, you know, equipped to to look after me now, which is the most important thing: looking after the public. Hmm. Um, Christian Police Association. Just in case anybody wants to get in touch, either as a soon-to-be or serving uh, police officer here in the UK, what's the website for the CPA? Yeah, if you just Google Christian Police Association, it's simple as that. Just put that into Google uh, or um, other search engines are available. <laughs> um, just put that in. That Literally, there is a, it's a one-button join us um, on, on the website. That will take you in. As, as a serving member of staff or a police officer or a retired cop, um, you can become a full member. Anyone can join the CPA as what we call sort of a friend of the CPA. So if you're a person who has a police officer um, who, you, who you, you care about or police officers in your church, you can join as an organisation to support the CPA uh, and you'll receive regular updates from CPA HQ about what's going on and also be dialed into your local CPA branch. So if you live in Northamptonshire, for example, you'll be dialed into the Northamptonshire branch and you will, you'll have contact from them as well. So you'll get to know the people down there. So I would fully endorse anyone joining up and um, just helping support the work of the charity across the UK. I didn't know about that last part about being able to just get information in order to pray better, I guess. Yeah. Um, so there you are. Go and look at the Christian Police Association. You can join as a police officer or you can join because you just want to pray better and have a better knowledge of what's going on and to show your, uh, your support for police officers across the UK. Um, uh, Keith, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we haven't got a picture today because uh, internet issues, but it's fine. I'm so happy that you've got your voice, which is great. So thank you, Keith, for your time. Um, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you for your service and go and check out the Christian Police Association if you want to know more. Keith, thank you. Bless you. Thanks a lot.